have a confession to make. I'm kind of passionate about Godzilla movies. So this is something that my family has kind of accepted. I'm a fully grown adult. And uh, that was my birthday present. <laughs> I still remember the first time I saw a Godzilla movie. To an eight-year-old boy, the idea of a giant monster that could breathe radioactive fire and destroy whole cities was absolutely terrifying. To me, Godzilla was a kind of unstoppable force. I actually had nightmares about Godzilla. But as I got a little bit older and a little less afraid, I began to rethink my views. The original Godzilla story begins with a small group of public officials who are seduced by the power of the atom bomb because they think it'll keep them safe. So quietly, kind of out of view, they begin to build the weapon. Meanwhile, the public is, like, distracted. They're focused on other things. And they're not really paying attention. And so they're not serving as a kind of check on the wisdom of their government choices. So, rather than making everybody safe, radiation from nuclear testing creates Godzilla. And he emerges from the ocean and stomps the planet flat. So, I begin to see this less as a movie about a monster and more as a kind of metaphor about the relationship between citizens and their governments in a democracy. When we ignore big problems, they don't go away. They get bigger. Sometimes they come back as giant monsters who seek to destroy us. Look, I teach foreign policy at the University of Georgia. And one of the things that I find, like, really fascinating and uh, a little bit scary is the same story is playing out right now. Every day, all around the world, governments are making really important decisions about nuclear weapons that affect all of our security. And they're doing it in much the same way, quietly, largely out of the public view. Let me give you one example. Recently, the United States government announced a 30-year, $1.7 trillion plan to build a whole new class of nuclear weapons. This includes small, accurate, mobile warheads that can be deployed anywhere in the world and used alongside conventional weapons in a war. It's just one example. There are many, many more that we could talk about. In fact, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has figured out a really clever and compelling way to display all of the risks that we face from the intentional or the accidental use of nuclear weapons in one place. They call it the Doomsday Clock. And each year, the Doomsday Clock is reset to represent the level of risk to our planet from nuclear war. So I hope some of us are asking, what time is it, right? It's 11.58. It's two minutes to midnight. We haven't been this close for 50 years, since the early days of the Cold War. Now, the point of all this is not to scare you, though, like, I would understand if some of you are just, uh, like, a little bit freaked out. The point of this, and the point of the doomsday clock, is to remind us that if we ignore the risk that nuclear weapons face, or present us with, the problem isn't going to go away. It's getting bigger. Like, Godzilla is out there right now, swimming around in the ocean, waiting to come back. I think the most important lesson from this story is that even if they're well-intentioned, small groups of public officials, if they're ignored, sometimes make really bad decisions. In fact, even experts make mistakes. And as a scholar, I've always been fascinated by that idea. I wanted to know if it applied to the really big choices that our society faces about nuclear weapons and war. So along with my colleague, Dr. Zach Zawald at the University of Houston, we designed a really cool experiment. We wanted to see if we could get a group of experts to start a nuclear war by accident. 
to do this, yeah, we recruited 300 active duty U.S. military commanders with advanced training in policy and security strategy who range in rank from major through general. This is an, a really impressive group of people. They have far more experience than our average politician. In our experiment, we gave them a packet of information. Uh, it had intelligent reports, intelligence reports about a, a, a kind of a security crisis overseas. It had information about the number of troops that are involved and about the number of civilians that might die if there was a conflict. We had them read this information, and then we asked them to make a choice. In response to the crisis, should the United States stand firm, or should it risk starting a nuclear war with another country. We wanted to see if we could affect their choice using something psychologists call cognitive bias. This is an example of a cognitive bias. There are many. This is one that we used in our experiment. And I want to talk about it today because I think it's one that many of us are familiar with. It's called loss aversion. And loss aversion is designed to capture the idea that for most of us in our everyday lives, Losses just hurt more than gains feel good. So think about it this way. Imagine you're walking to the coffee shop, and on the sidewalk, you find a $20 bill. That's pretty cool. Think about the opposite. You get to the counter, you order the coffee, and you realize that $20 fell out of your pocket. That's not just a pretty bad day. It's a really, 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 really bad day. And loss aversion captures that concept. It also has some really interesting consequences for us. When we're focused on losses, we tend to take more risks in our everyday life than when we're focused on gains. So what we wanted to know was if we could trigger the experts on loss aversion and get them to take a risk and start a war. So here's how we did it. This is just a snippet from that packet of information I mentioned earlier. It's um, a, a conflict where a certain number of people are going to die. Now, we have two versions of this same conflict. The same number of people live and die in each. If you notice, we've just reframed how we talk about it. In the first example, we focused on the number of lives saved. In the second, we focus on the number of lives lost. We did this in order to trigger loss aversion. From the point of view of an expert decision maker, this shouldn't make any difference, right? The choice about whether or not to go to war in this scenario should be based on your experience and your knowledge and the demands of the moment. When we ran the experiment, here's what we found. It turns out it's really easy to trigger experts on loss aversion. In fact, just reframing the same piece of information from gains to losses more than doubled the number of experts who recommended going to war with a nuclear-armed country. Okay, so now this is not great news, right? These kinds of choices, they need to be based on facts, not bias, not how information is framed. So we thought to ourselves, okay, look, maybe this isn't all bad. We can save this thing. Maybe it's the case that experts are just less vulnerable to loss aversion than the rest of us. So we reran the experiment on a random sample of adults. People just like you and me. Okay, so this is when things got really weird. It turns out that it's easier to trigger experts on loss aversion and get them to take risks than the average person. We were very surprised by this. But we think we know what's going on. Look, if you're a security professional, your job is to think about really terrible things every day, right? War and peace, casualties. So you're always kind of already in a loss frame, and you're probably more easily triggered in the loss frame thinking. What this means for us is that even though problems might seem really important, a little bit scary, probably complicated, that doesn't mean we should just always assume that experts have the right answers. Because sometimes they don't. And our research is beginning to show this. Look, for me, the idea that 
we should always defer to a small group of officials or that we should or could ignore our problems and hope they go away has never been something that rests easily with me. But it didn't become uncomfortable for me just when I became an academic. It started when I was a little kid on the living room floor watching Godzilla movies with my brother. Because in every Godzilla movie, there's a Godzilla, but there's always a hero who saves the day. The hero is an everyday person, not better educated, not better trained. It's somebody who's guided by a moral compass rather than by a political compass. The everyday hero sees solutions to the problems that the narrowly trained experts can't ever even imagine. It's because in Godzilla movies, like in everyday life, the solutions to our big challenges usually don't come from the people who created the problem in the first place. The solutions come from folks who have a broader perspective and a more balanced view. So here's the deal. You and I, all of us, we have the opportunity to be the everyday heroes in this real-life Godzilla movie that we're living. The question is, what do we do? Okay, for me, this is really about information. We need more of it. A recent survey of high school seniors revealed that less than 1% of them could identify all the countries that had a nuclear weapon. Let's get real. How many of us could do that? Yeah, so you might agree with me. You might say, look, I get it. I need more information, but this is a really kind of big and scary topic, and it seems really confusing, and I don't know where to go to begin. And I hear that all the time, and I'm sympathetic. I agree with you. If I had a magic wand, if I could tell you, like, there's some magic machine sitting in the dark somewhere waiting to answer all of your questions, I would tell you where that is. We're not helpless. <laughs> we can do a lot on our own. And that's really the point. If we're going to survive, every single one of us needs to take the responsibility to develop a kind of nuclear literacy and then go back to our political leaders and tell them to actually make us safe. Tell them to dial back the doomsday clock. Now, that's going to not be, it's not going to be easy. I, I'm not trying to sort of tell you that this is a simple thing. You would face resistance. It's a common refrain in our politics and even from our political leaders that questions about war and nuclear weapons are too big. They're too important to get bogged down in our messy politics. We should let the experts, the adults in the room, handle these issues. Okay, fine. For me, there are also the lessons of Godzilla. Our society makes better choices when everybody participates and when every voice is heard because that gives us the best chance of finding an actual solution. So when I think about all this stuff, it kind of boils down to a question that I ask myself every single day before I walk into the classroom. It's a question I'm going to ask that some of you consider tonight, probably for the first time. It's 11.58, two minutes to midnight. Don't you deserve more time? Thank you very much.